have those bathroom breaks. If you've got a conversation that's so urgent, take it into the hallway. We're going to begin the next panel. We're even missing a panelist at this point, but we hope to find her. We know she's here in the building, but uh, uh, I'm going to go ahead and start the panel and deal with introductions, and hopefully she will materialize before it is time for her to speak. Uh, but this panel was, we got to the first part of it in the uh, previous uh, one, which is a case study on the Little Red Fire Ants and the Rapid Ohio Debt. And they're two invasive species that have significant ecological impacts in Hawaii. They were discovered in Hawaii at different times. The little fire ants were discovered in 1999. The rapid Ohio death was discovered in 2014. And during this case study, the panelists will discuss the impacts that these species, there she is, that these species uh, uh, have on Hawaii and compare the differences between responses to their introduction. And I apologize if I slaughter a name here, uh, uh, but in order of, of them speaking, will be Cass Vanderwood, the research manager of the Hawaii Ant Lab. And um, he was born in Holland, grew up in Australia, uh, has worked extensively throughout the, the Pacific region on these issues. And for some reason, it says here that in his spare time, he restores vintage motorcycles, which I hope do not transfer invasives from one place to another. Then we have Michelle Montgomery. Just the human ones. Yeah, just human invasives. Uh, Michelle Montgomery, Program Specialist for the Hawaii Ant Lab. Uh, she's originally from California, lived on the Big Island since 2002, uh, began her career in entomology then. Um, and uh, I don't know how I'm getting these individual things, but I'm starting to like them. Uh, uh, she skates for the Volcano, Volcano Vixens roller derby team. Uh, uh, in Hilo, where she goes by the name De Kraken. So, <laughs> if that leads to questions during the question period, so be it. Uh, uh, our third <laughs> panelist is uh, uh, Rob Hauf. He's the State Protection Forester for the Hawaii Department of Land and Natural Resources, manages the statewide forest health program, uh, focusing on invasive plants, insects, and uh, diseases. And our fourth panelist is Jonathan Ho, who's the plant quarantine branch manager of the Hawaii Department of Agriculture. He was born and raised on Oahu, um, and uh, he enjoys spending his free time with his wife and 17-month-old son, as well as collecting and propagating a wide range of ornamental plants. So with that, we're going to begin the presentations with Cass. Hi, I'm Cass Vanderwood. I, I run the Hawaii Ant Lab, uh, which is uh, a project of the Pacific Cooperative Studies Unit, which in turn is part of UH. Um, I'm not alone. I have a small team of people to do my work for me. I just take the credit for what they do. That's my job. But they, these guys, Jack, Heather, Ursel, Michelle, Alison, Mikey and Matthew, actually do all the hard work on the ground. Uh, and uh, we're very lucky to have... Uh, uh, a large number of funding partners, great, great and small, but we work with them very closely to uh, have them achieve their objectives through them giving us money. But just getting on, and, and the, most of this talk is really for the benefit of our visitors, our, our guests. Most people that live in Hawaii are very well aware of little fire ants. Um, so I'm trying to give you a picture of what it's like to live with this particular species. And normally with, um, <coughs> with social insects, especially ants, people tend to think, well, I've already got ants around my house. This new ant is simply going to replace the ants that I already have, and they won't be much worse. They might even be better. Who, who knows? But some species cause a fairly large variety of impacts, and little fire ants can really cut across most sectors of, uh, of uh, so society and, and our ecosystems. Uh, and the first thing is that these little bastards sting, which people don't seem to like. Um, and if you've got a lot of them around your house and in your house and you're being stung daily, it certainly uh, turns, uh, turns paradise into, into um, quite a miserable existence. 
Uh, if, you're a, if you're a domestic or a wild animal, you will also be stung, so it's not just uh, restricted to humans. Uh, and um, with, uh, with domestic pets, what we see in areas that are badly infested with fire ants is that a very large portion of the dogs and the cats and the chickens and whatever else people have are blind or, or at least partially blind. Uh, and that's through the, the ants stinging these animals in the eyes. Uh, if you're working in agriculture, if you're physically working in agriculture, ex expect to get stung on a daily or an hourly basis, I, I would think. Uh, this increases the, the difficulties associated with getting people to do basic work on farms. Uh, it increases management costs because farmers and primary producers need to do things and buy things to try to manage the problem. Um, the yields are going to be reduced, so whatever you're growing, you're going to be growing less of it per, per acre. Uh, and it is difficult to find workers in some instances. Natural areas, these things can be, can be quite devastating. Um, I suppose the, the biggest impact is to, to other invertebrates and insects, but um, it, it really changes forest ecosystems, which become a place where most vertebrate animals simply cease to live. So if you're... If you were to imagine a, uh, an, an area of rainforest that's, that's infested by LFA, you're very unlikely to see other animals in that infested area. They tend to leave and go and live elsewhere or, or get preyed or starve to death. And it's a great, there's a great impact on government, and I put that in obviously because of the, the uh, meeting that we are currently in, but it, it's an increased cost because and control is an ongoing problem, it's an ongoing cost, and uh, local, state and federal governments then need to increase their budgets to manage public land. Uh, on, and on top of that, now, from a political perspective, people tend to have a lot of constituents that are not very happy. So it really does affect everyone and everything. And you think that being an ant, all you have to do is get a can of fly spray and spray the ants that you see and the problem goes away. But that's not really, not really the case. Generally with invasive ants and wasmania in particular, they don't just replace the existing ant fauna that, uh, that happen to be on a site. They, they change the whole environment and change energy flows and nutrient flows to benefit themselves. So what we end up with is a lot more ants on a per acre basis than we would normally be used to, and I'll get into this later on. Um, these, these ants, for, uh, uh, for very clear reasons, when you look at their native habitat, uh, live in trees, they, they nest and live in trees, and that's quite unusual for ants. Ants generally have their nests in the ground or on the ground, and so they're easy to see and easy to get to for control or treatment purposes. In the case of little fire ants, they'll live in the tree canopy no matter how, how high that canopy might be. So if there were fire ants around this resort and there were some 100-foot coconut palms, there'd be fire ants at the very crown of those coconut palms. And you'd think an animal evolved to live in trees would be good at staying there, but they're terrible at hanging on. So any little breeze or bump tends to dislodge a number of ants each time and those ants fall out of trees and onto people and animals where they tend to sting and cause, cause a lot of problems. One thing I've noticed about LFA, LFA being little fire ants, uh, is that they're really good at recovering from whatever we try to do to them. If we try to kill them by whatever means that we have at our disposal, they're very quick at being able to, to completely uh, come back to their original population. That's quite a problem. And because we live in paradise and these ants really like our climate and our vegetation structure and the fact that we, have, we don't have a hot winter or a cold, a hot summer or a cold winter. In fact, we're in the middle of a very cold winter right now and you've probably all noticed now it must have gotten down to 65 degrees last night. Freezing. So for most pest ants, they have a, a peak production period that tends to be in 
mid-spring and uh, late summer and fall. And uh, certainly in the southern USA where we, where we have other invasive ant species, that's when they're at their worst. And in the middle of summer and in the middle of winter, they're not really very pr productive because the, the weather's too dry or too hot or too cold or there's no food around. In Hawaii, we don't have those, uh, those blockages in population growth. These animals are able to reproduce year round. So it's a 24 seven, 12 months a year problem. To give you some idea of, on some of these um, things that I've pointed out, the first thing is population density. You can imagine there are 20, there can be 20 million ants. I have a quarter acre lot of land, I have 20 million little fire ants on my quarter acre of land. If I was able to, and they're only a millimetre in size, so that's what, about a sixteenth of an inch. If I were able to capture all my ants and lay them in a line, I, I could make a line about 12 miles long. Uh, that's if you didn't get run over by a car if you were using a road. But what that means is that there's, there's a shitload of ants on my place. And no matter what I do, uh, even though I kind of know what I'm doing, I can't kill all of them in the one hit. And if I don't repeat what I'm doing often enough, I'm simply uh, contributing to a, to a cycle where the ants recover uh, even before I get round to treating them again. So I end up in this horrible cycle of using pesticides and not really seeing any, any benefit from it. Getting to the tree canopy side of things, we have some nice beaches in Hawaii. Uh, on Hawaii Island, we don't have that many beaches, but we do have some. Uh, and they tend to be fringed with palms, which is what the tourists like. Uh, and the ants like that too. So they'll be living up there, get a nice afternoon trade breeze coming across the beach and you're going to be sitting in the shade under the palm trees on your vacation, being rained on by little fire ants. And tourists don't like that and we don't like it either, to be honest. But the problem there is, one, is how do we get these ants that are causing all the, all the trouble? How do we kill them? Uh, given that they're 100 feet from where we can get to, and two, how do we deal with how do we deal with the issues not only at tourist level but at everyday people's home level, when we have this in a very, very broadly, uh, broadly di distributed um, locations all across the island. To give you some idea of what the stings look like, it, it, it depends, it, the reactions are very individualised, so some people simply get a bit of a rash, other people will get rather large welts, some people need to take a couple of um, Advil and take a lie down for a day or two. Everybody reacts differently, but everybody does react. As do pets, uh, pets being uh, spending a lot of time outside, tend to have this, tend to be in areas where they're rained down on by these little ants. Some of them will find their way to the pet's eyes where they become alarmed and sting. And those stings appear to form these cloudy spots in the corneas and, and eventually uh, those spots join up and, and lead to, to partial or, or even total blindness. And so about a third of the, the domestic pets that live in areas that are badly infested will look like these photos. Most of these photos are from local pets. So about a third of pet owners have pets that have, find it difficult to, to see because of this problem. Uh, of all of the ants, the species that I've, I've had the, the pleasure of working with, these guys are the, the best farmers of plant pests. So mealybugs, scale insects, plant hoppers, aphids, things that poop out, sugary things. The little fire ants will look after them on plants and uh, move them around, protect them from their biological controls and, and their natural enemies. So what we end up with is an ecosystem that has ants and these, these plant pests supporting the ant population and the, the trees and especially the productive trees having to, having to cope with a, a, a lower yields and certainly lower quality uh, produce at the same time. We aren't alone and if you, if you look at the distribution of this species worldwide, they're, they're found from Spain down to a smaller island south of Tahiti, although they're, all, they're native to, uh, broadly native to 
South America, they really seem to enjoy that, that part of the world that uh, lies between the Tropic of Cancer and Capricorn. And unfortunately, that puts us in the middle of the problem. But um, they are, that problem is worldwide, but it seems to be spreading fairly quickly through what we call the, the US affiliates or the, the island nations and states and jurisdictions that are tied to the US in some way. And uh, we, we're running out of new islands to see infested. So in the, in the past year, we've, uh, they were, have been reported on the app in American Samoa, where uh, hopefully they can be eradicated, but they're currently there and causing problems. Guam uh, managed to uh, uh, d discover them about eight years ago or seven years ago, and they've spread uh, steadily through the Hawaiian Islands also. So it's not just a Hawaii problem, it's really it's a Pacific-wide problem, and all the US affiliates in the Pacific either have this particular ant or will have it at some point in the future. So in Hawaii, we, they were first reported in 1999 by my old boss, Pat Conant. At the time that they were discovered, they were actually well established in the, uh, in the eastern part of Hawaii Island. Uh, and uh, from what I can gather, a fairly immediate response ensued, which was probably never going to eradicate this species. Certainly a very, very solid attempt at trying to contain them to, to the initial areas where they were discovered. But uh, ants being ants and people being people, very quickly they managed to, to spread through the rest of the state. So con almost at the same time as being discovered in, in Hilo, the plant quarantine folks, the state plant quarantine folks, by using tra trace back and trace forward methodologies, managed to find them on the island of Kauai um, at about the same time. Um, for the next few years, they s sort of spread and solidified along the east coast of Hawaii Island. Uh, and then uh, about 2009, uh, they were discovered on a, on a property on Maui. Uh, and uh, at about the same time, they started to spread across to the western half of the island. If you've had the the uh, privilege of driving around Hawaii Island, you'll know that most of the centre of it is not not uh, not populated and and, and 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 a bit harsh for social insects like ants. But um, we've managed to help them cross that fairly easily. Uh, at the end of 2014 or the beginning of 2014, I'm not sure. Multiple infestations were discovered on again on Maui and also on Oahu. Uh, uh, and all of these neighbour island uh, interceptions are, are being addressed and uh, certainly we're trying to eradicate them now with the knowledge of how serious this particular pest is. 2016 was a bad year for Maui um, and uh, ants continue to spread uh, and we continue to try to kill them. So what I've tried to do, hopefully, is just give a, just a basic talk about the, um, the sort of impacts that you can expect if you have little fire ants and what happened in the early years of, uh, of having, having these in, in, on the island. And I, I think Michelle is next, and she's going to be talking about how to kill them and how to kill them properly. That's one thing that she's pretty good at. Thank you very much, Cass. Michelle, welcome. Hey, thank you. Um, so, Cass gave a good introduction about the little fire ants, and really, I think the species kind of highlights what we were talking about, what you guys were talking about at the previous panel, about a particular species that is looked at more as a local or regional pest and doesn't get a lot of attention on the national scale. Despite the fact that this is actually fairly widespread, especially in the Pacific, through all US uh, affiliate Pacific Islands. Um, so what's, what's the issue? Um, we're not really sure. Uh, I guess uh, other bigger, badder ants take the, the limelight. Um, and so it's, it's nice to be able to um, 
work on this because really we were able to do all of the components that, it, that go into successful managing of introduced pests. Um, collaborations, doing applied work like research in the lab and in the field, um, and then also, or that's uh, the academic work, and then applied work into the field, actually taking everything that we know from the research side and implementing that in the field. Um, without any one of these components, the whole thing's going to fall apart. So we need to have our collaborations, right? Um, the interagency collaborations uh, is the top most important thing because it brings together everything. It brings together expertise from smaller agencies uh, or organizations that really specialize and focus on a specific pest. It um, brings together funding collaborators, people with money to be able to actually do these things, the research and the applied work. Um, it brings um, people with regulatory authority to come and be able to go onto people's properties who are not necessarily willing to just let everybody come in and do what needs to be done to manage these pests. Um, it also brings manpower because some of us, like the Hawaii Ant Lab, we're a small lab, we can't do everything. So we work with BISC and we work with KISC, um, the invasive species committees throughout the, the state for manpower and we all work very well together. Um, they benefit because we're helping them and we benefit because they're helping us. And so it's a good give and take relationship um, for, for everybody involved. Um, with, I feel like um, the whole applied work, eradications, the big E word, um, this gets all of the attention. This gets the majority of the funding. Um, but without academic research, we're not able to have the tools in place in order to have these successful eradications, these successful um, campaigns. And so in the past when, when the little fire ants were discovered on Hawaii, there was some work done. There wasn't a lot of work done. So we did rely on research from Florida, from USDA in Florida, uh, to, to see, okay, well, we need to develop some kind of rapid response. Um, the information at the time wasn't complete, and so the, the methods didn't work. And it's because they didn't under, we didn't understand um, the ants living in the trees, not coming to the ground. We didn't have the tools available to make it successful. And so what happens, those, uh, those observations in the field go back and feed back into the research to do more research in order to make um, more, or more effective treatment uh, and tools. Um, and so without this, uh, this flow, um, it's, it, we never get ahead. Um, fortunately, we were able to go back to the drawing board, figure out what these problems were, how to adjust, address these problems, then bring them back into the field, and now we see a much uh, better response and more success. Um, and so both of these are equally important. We're not gonna be able to do one without the other. And these are just some of the things that um, you see, or that we do. We do laboratory experiments. We look at different types of baits. Um, we help with other, um, with private industry, um, chemical companies, testing out their baits, but also trying to get their products um, to be uh, legally used in our gel matrix that we can use to treat in the trees, on the ground, um, everywhere, um, to treat three-dimensionally. We also are looking at different uh, marking techniques for, um, for distribution and to be able to see how things spread throughout a system, like uh, baits and food resources, because that's gonna help us to determine um, how much 
bait we really need to put out in order to affect an entire system. We do a ton of surveys. Um, that last picture that you saw up there was just the, the samples that we put out on Kauai um, last year. It was uh, almost 15,000 samples um, in just one survey effort, which took a while, <laughs> took a few months, but it was an incredible density and we got per good coverage. Um, we work with the public. We talk to them about, uh, about how to manage their ants. We treat or we, we teach them how to manage their, their problems and we give them the tools for them to go out and do it. Um, and so we, we do a lot of different things and I feel like I'm just going around in circles. <laughs> that just like my flow charts, it's all connected and we just keep going around in circles and sharing everything with each other. Mm. I guess, yeah. Michelle, keep thank you. <laughs> Rob, welcome. Thanks, John. Uh, my name is Rob Hoff. I'm a forester with the State Department of Land and Natural Resources. I'm based on Oahu, working out of the same office um, as jo Josh Atwood, who was in the previous. So today, uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Ohia and a disease that's threatening Ohia. Uh, Ohia is probably the most important tree species in Hawaii. It is the foundation of native Hawaiian ecosystems. Uh, it has um, significant cultural um, values to the native Hawaiians, and it grows in a really wide variety of habitats. Uh, this photo shows it growing on uh, lava on Hawaii Island. So I'm going to give you um, kind of a, a, a historical um, overview, and then also talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing on the ground to address this problem. So back in 2010, uh, residents on Hawaii Island on the east side there in that map started noticing that trees on their property were suddenly dying. The leaves were turning orange brown and over a matter of um, days. And initially we weren't too concerned. Ohia does have other pests, it does die. Um, but the, the reports continued to come in and we started taking it more seriously in 2013, conducted surveys in this area of the island and um, started to realize that this was uh, something significant and started looking for a cause. We actually came up with a name for the disease before we knew what was causing it and started calling it rapid Ohia death because of the, the rapid disease progression. Um, it wasn't until 2014 that uh, uh, pathogen was isolated from a wood sample uh, by uh, University of Hawaii, and uh, this was a, a disease that had never been found uh, in association with Ohia. Um, from there, USDA um, Agriculture Research Service um, conducted Cox postulates, which is basically proving whether something is the killer of the plant, so they would isolate the pathogen from the wood, they would uh, inoculate seedlings of Ohia, and um, once the seedling died, they would uh, be able to isolate the pathogen, proving that that's what had killed it. Um, so that happened relatively quickly, and also in 2014, they found an additional pathogen very closely related um, to the initial one, Stratocystis. Um, and these were new pathogens to science, and just recently, have been um, described and characterized in the literature, um, which is uh, really critical for responding. So now we know that we have two different species of Stratocystis. One is a very fast moving aggressive killer. The other one is a little bit more slow acting and requires multiple infections to kill a tree. So once we had a causal agent, Agencies really rallied and came together to respond to this threat. Uh, with Ohia being such an important species, uh, everybody really wanted to do anything uh, in their capacity to help with the situation. So agencies came together, they uh, uh, wrote a strategic response plan together. We were able to acquire some initial seed funding through private foundations, which was really key. Those funds were very flexible and allowed us to do some of the initial work, especially doing outreach to communicate to communities, 
and others in Hawaii uh, about this problem. So the response, what does that response look like? Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we're, we're handling the issue. Uh, we conduct aerial surveys twice a year throughout the state via helicopters. We're using a forest service developed application uh, based on a tablet that allows us to quickly map uh, symptomatic trees and then download that information into a shared database that all of the partners can view. Those aerial surveys are followed up by ground surveys where crews go out into often remote areas and they take samples from trees. Um, we now have a, a portable lab that was developed by USGS scientists that allow the crews to screen those samples in the field. All positives are then submitted to USDA for verification. Once we find an outbreak in a new area that hasn't been widely affected by rapid oohia death, uh, we, we attempt containment um, using what we know about the disease. So the disease is inside the wood of the tree um, and it only gets released into the environment when ambrosia beetles come and attack those dead trees. Um, their, their frass, their boring dust gets pushed out of the, the holes that they create in trees and spreads in the environment via wind. So we try to uh, reduce the threat of that dust spreading in the environment by wind. W where possible, we fell trees. Uh, we cover them with tarps where it's practical to prevent the beetles from going in and attacking them or um, experiment with insecticides to, to repel those beetles. And then there's follow-up monitoring. We're working with a UH Hilo who's using drones to monitor the areas where we treat. They go into these areas every month they fly their drones and look for any additional dead trees so that the managers can respond. We're also conducting this monitoring work in areas where there is no management so we can compare the, the uh, progress of the disease in these different sites and see if our management, management actions are having any effect. Um, but we still lack tools to properly address this disease throughout the state. Um, one of the challenges is detecting the disease before trees are symptomatic. Right now, new detections are found when trees die. It would be great if we could find a way to um, get, get locations of the disease before it caused tree death. And there's a detector dog project, and we're also looking at using remote sensing to see the initial symptoms. Uh, we need more tools to suppress the beetle activity. Think, we think this is really the, the place where we can intervene and have an effect. Um, but we need uh, insecticides and repellents um, labeled for use in the forest. Uh, USDA is also looking into fungicide applications, just injecting tree by tree, which would have limited, limited use, but could be another important tool. Uh, uh, several entities are looking at remote sensing technologies to better detect and monitor rod throughout the state. Uh, we're working with a forest service to come up with treatments for infected logs so that they can move. Ohia logs are used in construction, and right now, uh, under the quarantine that Jonathan's gonna talk about, they have to be tested, which is labor-intensive. And finally, for long-term management, we're looking at genetic disease resistance for restoring these areas, and that's a, that's a multi-decade uh, effort, but getting things underway now is, uh, is prudent, so. With that, I'll pass it on to Jonathan. Thanks, Rob. Uh, hi, um, Jonathan Ho. I'm the uh, acting manager for the Plant Quarantine Branch. Um, I'm not going to really talk about Rod or LFA. I'm just going to talk about rulemaking but in reference to those two things. Um, uh, I work for Plant Quarantine, and we do the regulation of uh, inter island movement and certification of, of uh, agricultural material um, within the state and into the state. So um, I don't have any pretty pictures except for this one. This is the last picture you guys are going to see from my, my uh, slide. That's what everything should look like. Okay, so this is kind of what we're going to cover, like what's a, what the interim rule is, um, how do you determine if it's applicable, and then if it is applicable, what... Um, what you're gonna do, and then how do you implement it, and then a little bit of questions. Um, I was gonna do actual rulemaking, because I thought some people might be interested, but I only have seven minutes, so that's gonna take a little longer. Um, okay, so Hawaii Revised Statutes, that's the Hawaii Plant Quarantine Law. Basically, we have the ability 
to, um, in the absence of effective rules, to create interim ones that can't last for more than one year in the, um, if there's a situation that affects public health and safety or their environment. And um, so I won't talk too much about the advisory committee, but um, there is a finding and there are a technical committee. So when we determine a rule, there are very specific things that are, are looked for. And then this is part of the challenges with the interim rule process. You needed to know a lot about of the biology with the pest. So with, you know, with you look at LFA and with rod, um, when they were both kind of detected, the, some, some of the challenges were there wasn't really that much known about them. So, you know, that really affected the ability to create an emergency. Um, and then again, same thing, pest status and damage. Where else in the world is it a problem? Rabbit hole of death, it's obviously nowhere else in the world, so how do you have a problem? Um, again, commodity and hosts, how it was discovered, and then the, 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 a lot of the key things for quarantine specifically is where is it? Because you need to know what you're going to be regulating. You can't just quarantine everything. So that, like, this is a lot of the stuff that's very important for creating rules and regulations to prevent movement or, or spread of pests. So, um, you know, after you go through all of that stuff, you're going to be kind of determined if a rule is warranted. And then basically what you're going to do is then to kind of determine what area you're going to quarantine. Um, in the past, there have been regional ones, like within an island or a county, and um, it creates some regulatory problems in that people drive, walk. You can't really have, a, have somebody there all the time. It's like speeding. You, you just can't have everybody there to comply and to make people comply. So what we've done now is to regulate via the island. So you have controlled points of entry or exit at the ports. So basically, we quarantine entire islands, which is basically what we did with Rod. Even though it was only on one side of the island at the time, yeah, we quarantined the entire island. And during the uh, quarantine uh, process or the or the the formulation, um, there's a very heavy. Um, focus on determining if there are measures that can disinfest commodities prior to movement. Um, you don't want to be like basically just shutting down everything, um, especially if there is, um, um, you know, things like um, like little fire ant where little fire ant can be on everything. You know, anything that has a crack can have a little fire ant and you can't regulate all of that stuff. And then you have things like rod where you have very specific industries like wood make, uh, like woodworking, like bowls or um, flooring or the, these wood post stuff where that th this is the guy's entire business and then you can't just completely shut them down. So, you know, with that being said, you're always looking for um, appropriate and like scientifically verified quarantine or treatment measures that will allow clean stock or clean material to move uh, from an infested area to a non-infested area and also to prevent it from being infested in transit. So this is like the nitty gritty. Um, so basically, you have def you've defined the rule. You kind of know what you're gonna, what how you're gonna implement it. So what's gonna happen is th th there are there's a there are a number of public processes where the public gets to um, speak to like the validity, or not the validity of, of a rule or the need for a rule. And um, that happens at the Advisory Committee for Plants and Animals and also at the Board of Agriculture. These are public meetings. They're publicly noticed. The public can come and testify um, for or against the rule. Um, for implementation of an interim rule, you, you don't have to do it on the island. If there's going to be an expansion of the quarantine, you have to do it on the island. So that creates a different set of challenges. Um, so um, if the board adopts the proposed rule, um, there we have to provide notice to the public um, via the website and then um, in a in written form through a paper of statewide uh, circula circulation. The Star Advertiser doesn't, or Star Bulletin doesn't exist anymore, so you have to go through four different papers to to do this. So that again, a little bit more issues. And then um, the most important things are a start date for the quarantine. And um, and that basically gives you know affected um, industries notice as to when they're going to need to start complying with that. So I think for Rod there was a there was a very clear start date into the future to give these guys the ability to comply prior to just um, um, enacting action. Because once the board makes action, if there's no date, it's actually the next day. That's when the rules come into into effect. And 
that's it. So if you need to talk to me, you can email me or call me. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thank you. <clears throat> I think we're going to do a couple of questions and then uh, uh, move to your questions. Y y let me ask, because you laid out uh, some of you sort of the response, how long it takes. It's obviously hand in hand, as was mentioned, with scientific research. How do you deal with the fact in, in one of these issues that the scientific research uh, might take a while and need to be peer reviewed? So to get to some of the strategies takes a while, but you're in the middle of the emergency and you're trying to address it. Uh, how do you deal with addressing it before you have any kind of sense of where the science is on some of the strategies? Yeah, Secretary Laird has um, asked a really interesting question, and that's really about the discipline of eradicating something or the science of it, and it's really an, it's an emerging discipline. Very few people are working on those nuts and bolts, what to do in a, in a, in a response, and um, I, uh, in, a, uh, in, in a past life, uh, headed up the scientific effort for the Brisbane Ready Port of Fire Ant response, which I think is since 2001 they've spent about $300 million trying to eradicate Ready Port of Fire Ants from Brisbane, still, still trying. And it's really difficult to do research in the middle of an eradication because your objective has to be killing everything that you're trying to study. And uh, that's actually a really, that, that is a very difficult thing for a researcher or an applied researcher or an operational person to deal with. How do you get the information you need? Um, and I guess it's one of the reasons I'm here, uh, be, be, because with little fire ants, we, I, it was pretty clear 10 years ago that we were stuck with them on this island, but we had opportunities to not have them spread to neighbor islands. And that gave us as researchers this ideal laboratory where we had a place where we could do stuff that didn't really matter. It did, but it wasn't going to influence the bigger outcome in order to develop methods that we could use to eradicate them from these neighbour islands. So you, you've actually hit upon one of, the, one of the very difficult areas of trying to eradicate something when you don't have a lot of knowledge about it. So the first thing we do generally is we, we hit the books and see what has been written or what research has been done on a particular um, animal or plant or disease or pest, uh, and uh, and sometimes just make a best guess. I uh, take our best guess at what might work. Others who would like to add to that, um, you know, with regard to um, um, uh, reacting or, or regulating, I guess the um, you know these um, incipient pests when there isn't a lot of um, uh, information known about them. Um, rod, uh, rapid ohia death, was a very, I think, a, um, a unique um, situation in that it had an economic, an environmental, and a cultural impact, um, clearly. And um, it really facilitated a lot of the regulatory action um, in the absence of, of science. And, um, you know, the um, and this goes kind of back to I think what the previous panel talked a lot about a lot about with um, collaboration. You know, the the department um, we're the regulator, but we worked with DLNR, we worked with UH, we worked with USDA to basically figure out what best to do to deal with this you know novel problem. Anyone else? I was just going to bring up with the rapid ohia death response. The, the science team has worked really closely with the managers, and you know they meet regularly, but managers attend. And when the managers meet, somebody from the science team is usually there to represent so that when management is being conducted on the ground, frequently the scientists are there setting up the monitoring protocols. And I think because of the, the magnitude of the impacts of this, this threat, um, all of the researchers recognize that the, the, the ultimate goal is to stop this, not to get publications out on it, and so they work really well with the managers um, to come up with uh, the best science and advise us on how we can move forward, and it's, I think it's been pretty successful. 
Great. Did you have something to add, Michelle? I just wanted to add that I think Rob um, made a very good point that it's not necessarily about, um, oftentimes it's not, it has nothing to do with getting something published or peer reviewed. It's about getting data saying, okay, this works. We're not going to, we're going to go and we're going to tell people this works. We can do this now. And then bigger along, like, bigger things can be worked on um, and then and peer reviewed and stuff. So there's a, like the short term solutions. What can we do now? And what can we, the information that we can get out to people so that they can start doing something now while we're also working on longer term solutions um, and fine tuning everything so that people have um, the tools they need for their specific situation. Um, the ants are, obviously very different than Rod. And so, and everybody needs something different. So with little fire ants, they behave um, differently in say, um, the, in these uh, dry um, kind of beach parks over on this side of the island um, versus in Hilo where it's a jungle. And we have huge mango trees and banyans that the ants are all the way up there. Both of those will take different things to, um, different tools to manage. And then you also have organic farmers who, well, they don't really have anything that they can use and keep their organic certification. So we're working on um, expanding all of that stuff. And those are the long-term solutions. I'm going to ask one other question, and we're kind of jammed for time. Uh, and then I'm going to go to your question, so be ready. And, and the one last question here for the panel is, uh, when Cass presented, he had a great map of how it had spread to different islands o over different years. How do you deal with the uh, different ways it might move from island to island, air, boat, other things in, in crafting a response? Yeah, that's a great question. and uh, it it highlights something that makes Hawaii fairly unique, in, certainly in the US as a state, and that is that, well, first of all, we're not connected to the rest of America uh, by land, but then within the state, every island is pretty much a county, so it's its own little fiefdom. Um, what that does is it, it, it's, a, it, it's a great opportunity, but, it's also come, but it comes at a price, and the opportunity is that we can prevent things spreading from county to county literally, uh, because there's an ocean barrier be between them. So we have points where things can be regulated. Now, I haven't lived on the mainland US, but I'm guessing that crossing a county line is not a big deal. You just get in your car and drive. Um, here, it's a slightly bigger deal, and that is that you've pretty much got to hop on an airplane to do so. Um, from, a, from a government and a policy, policy perspective, it, it means that you've got a a state with a massive coastline, very small population, not a particularly big economy, having to fund this, um, which a mainland state doesn't have that because they don't have the opportunity. So it's a, it's a, it's a benefit and a cost. Um, as far as the way things move around in the state, they're generally by air or by sea. If something travels with people, it's by air. Uh, we don't have that much passenger transport between islands by, uh, by any other means but a lot of stuff moves from island to island. Uh, and all of that stuff can, in the case of fire ants, could be potentially infested. And it doesn't matter what the stuff is, it, you can just have fire ants caught up with it. So from a, a regulatory perspective, it's a nightmare because as Jonathan will tell you, he doesn't really have the authority to inspect everything that needs to be inspected. So they go for the, they go for the low, for the low-hanging fruit, which covers most of the risk, and we have to deal with the remainder of that risk in different, in 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 other ways. So, in in the case of ants and social insects, we do a lot of um, surveys at, at what we call points of entry, so mostly seaports and airports, in the hope that we can detect the movement of these things early, and um, jump on them and respond quickly. And that gives us the first of all the biggest probability of being successful, and two, means that we can write a smaller check in order to get that done. Uh, so uh, can, you be begin to wrap, we got, can you begin to wrap up your comment? 
I'll wrap it up now. Okay. We have 10 minutes left for audience. Is there any quick ad there, or can we go just to audience questions? Then this is your chance. Who would like to ask a question of this panel? Right back here. Thank you, Gordon Tribble, USGS. Cass, you ended with your um, talking about uh, intercepting at airports and seaports. So both of those are controlled by largely um, Young Brothers and Hawaiian Airlines. And they don't have an inherent profit motive in engaging in a lot of this that I'm aware of. So what, what inducements do you provide or how, how does that go to try and get private sector on board for what's got to be some kind of inconvenience on their part? Yeah, um, that's an interesting question. Uh, first of all, be because we don't have that many carriers of things, whether it's people or goods, Young Brothers and Hawaiian Airlines would be two of the larger ones, uh, that, that small group of transport companies are actually quite proactive and they see, like most people that live here, whether they w were born here or not, see looking after, the, looking after the paradise that they're in as being a fairly important part of their lives and that carries through into a business sense as well. So Young Brothers and Hawaiian Airlines are both quite proactive and quite uh, keen to be on board, less keen to spend money as all companies would be. But uh, so we, we, we have a series of overla overlapping projects that kind of assist. So there's a, at the moment, the, the Department of Transport is, is running a, a project to try to deal with early detection and response uh, from within that department, and that's worked fairly well. And uh, there, are pe there are people here that work on that project, and we kind of help. But early de detection and prevention are certainly two of the things that we need to spend uh, as much of our resources on as we can, because there's a much bigger payback on, on those two things. Anybody have something to add? Oh, uh, I can add a little bit to that. Um, so w the, there are very little carriers. Um, um, but as Cass said, they are very proactive, um, you know, because they're so little carriers, if something moves, they're going to be to blame. I mean, because it has to go on a boat or a plane. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's, that's, their, um, that's their public reality. And um, with exa for example, with Young Brothers, I mean, they're, they're hyper vigilant to some extent. Um, like, for example, with Rod, um, they actually stopped moving stuff before the quarantine even existed. As, as a private business, they have that, that right. So, you know, the, oh, he, like they were calling us for eucalyptus trees. Like, you can't move this. It's a log. We're like, it's not regulated. It's not a problem. But they were stopping everything that could be a, a potential for um, uh, moving rod. And then, um, like, for example, another one is uh, Aloha Airlines. Um, during the, um, like, the summer, like, well, I guess, like, the, the, the lychee, longan, rambutan season, um, there's a lot of it that leaves this island that goes through across the rest of the state. And, um, you know, LFA being a very um, good farming insect, it is very often found on, um, LFA, on, on, on those fruit. So um, fruit are not regulated um, in, th in, in the sense that they need to be inspected prior to movement. Um, they're subject to random inspections. Uh, with that being said, um, in Hilo, we've worked with Aloha Aloha Airlines, and basically Aloha Airlines won't ship anything, or at least those fruit, without, without it being inspected. So they're creating regulation on their own as, as a private business. And with that being said, it, um, that has like, uh, I think um, since they started doing that was about two years ago, um, there's been like, I, I wanna say like an like a 85, 90% reduction in LFA interceptions on the other islands because they're basically not letting anybody ship anything unless it's been inspected. You know, so, so I think the, the, the carriers are very well aware of their role, and, um, and I think they can do more. Um, some of them are more proactive than others, and you know, I think the bigger the organization, like for example, Hawaiian, there's a little bit of a challenge because, like for example, like the cargo guys, excellent. They know what the regs are. Hey, the stuff wasn't inspected, we heard this. But the ticketing agents, not so good, you know, and like you, you go, you do the, um, you'll do pa passenger surveillance and you'll see plants sticking out of people's bags. And you're like, oh, it's not come it's not inspected. Oh, nobody told me it needed to be inspected. You know, so th there, there's this, um, you know, uh, 
perpetual need to conduct uh, education and outreach to people. You know, there, there's turnover and stuff like that. So how do you maintain that, that momentum going forward? I think there are certain segments where it's very good, and there's others that, you know, that leave a lot to be, to be desired. But, you know, we're, we're working toward that. Okay, we have time for one more question. Actually, we have time for one more answer, so. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, again, my name's Mike Harrington. I work for the Western Association of Agricultural Experiment Station Directors. And, <clears throat> excuse me, 13 Western states and four Pacific territories. So, and, and not only that, but I lived in Hawaii for 16 years, and so this is old home week for me in many respects. Uh, one of the things that, that occurred to me in listening to this, and, and we struggled. You know, I, I was uh, director of the experiment station in CTAR and, and then dean of the college subsequent to that. Um, we struggle when these things arise to mount a response because we don't have resources or, and we didn't have resources. And do you have some recommendations? And, and I encourage this group to think about recommendations, not only to the governor of this state, but the governors of all of our states in the West uh, uh, about the need for resources to, to deal with these kinds of issues. So any comments? Who wants to take that? Well, I just mentioned that one of the things, I mean, you've really hit on uh, the biggest challenge, especially when there's an initial detection of something new. And one of the ideas that we've been discussing for years is coming up with a way that we can have an emergency response fund that can be quickly drawn down, um, that we don't have to wait for the next legislative session for something to be inserted in the budget. But that's a that's a very difficult thing to do for a number of reasons, and usually the legislature isn't big on creating a special fund like that. that um, and then whose, whose discretion is it to say when it's used as well can also be a challenge, but it's something I think we still have as a goal. Who would like to add to that? Since the governor's in the room and you um, work for him. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, well, at least from like uh, from plant quarantine standpoint. So like you know, we regulate movement for importation and, and interrelated movement, um, fully staffed. Um, so these uh, the guys that do the work, boots on the ground, um, inspectors and the technicians. There's 85 guys um, across the entire state. Um, you know. It was said, what, 80 to 90% of our food is, imp is imported. And that's only the food. That's not the rest of the stuff. You know, there's five boats, 1,000 containers a boat a week. So you need 5,000 containers a week. And that's only sea. You know, and you have 85 guys doing it. I mean, I mean that's just some of the reality. Um, how do we fix it? Um, it'd be great if you could have 200 guys. And, you know, um, among other things, I mean, there's been talk about, you know, do like New Zealand, give us police powers and guns, we arrest people and stuff like that. And, you know, great. But um, there, it, it's more than, I think, just resources. I think there needs to be a, um, a uh, I think, a, uh, a public sentiment or a, a public need for a lot of this to really occur. I mean, I can, we, people can ask for it, I mean, at, at a programmatic level, but if there really isn't a, um, a constituent need, it, it, it's not going to really happen, at least in my opinion. Do either of you have anything you'd like to add as a closing comment here? Yeah, just kind of, re just kind of uh, reinforcing what, what they said is, you know, having an emergency response fund would help tremendously, but ultimately uh, prevention is the cheaper, probably the cheaper way to go. Because once something gets established, then what are we going to do? Especially if we don't know how it's going to respond in uh, our environment. Um, there are many pet. There are many organisms that are not pests where they are normally from, um, or even in other places that they've been introduced. But once they come to a Hawaii, they act very differently, um, and we have no way to predict that. So preventing new things from coming in is essential, um, which means shoving and providing more resources to our regulatory agencies so that they can do their jobs the way they want to be able to do their jobs. Okay. Cass has a quick wrap-up answer. Um, and I'm not sucking up to the governor, but um, he, did, he did commission a, a biosecurity plan for the state, 
and that, that plan very clearly outlines that that's, that's an important component of any preparedness is to have, to have funds available uh, ready for when there is an emergency. So I, I'd like to hopefully wrap this question up by saying that the, that the Hawaii um, biosecurity plan is an excellent template, I think, for both for us in Hawaii to follow, but perhaps for other states to look at and consider how, how those recommendations might, might work for them in their different circumstances as, as well. It's a perfect closing comment. Please thank this panel for a great day. Uh,